So we're approaching the point in the course where we start doing statistics. I'm pretty sure everyone's very excited about that. But before we do that, I want to give an overview of why statistics are so important for agricultural scientists or really any other kind of scientists. Why do we care so much about statistics and why is it so central to what we do? Uh, it comes down to uh, validity, sampling, and bias, the three topics we're going to cover in this lecture. And so, again, the goal here, we're not going to do any math, but I want to explain to you why statistics uh, are, are important. So let's get started. Scientific confidence is very different than the kind of confidence that Lizzo sings about in her songs. Hey, Lizzo. Sorry. No offense. Here's an example of a scientific con context where uh, we think about confidence. Let's say we're talking about that Prolac dairy supplement, an example I gave in a previous lecture. So um, you give Prolac to a bunch of dairy cows, you take another group of dairy cows, you don't give them Prolac, and you measure their milk production. And um, you find that there's a significant increase in milk production in the cows you gave Prolac to. Uh, and we can generalize that example to, to basically any other agronomy or an animal science trial. We impose a treatment uh, between different groups, and we see if that treatment had a significant effect on our outcome of interest, our dependent variable, milk, milk production here. So confidence comes into how sure are we that this significant difference, this significant increase in milk production was due to prolac and not just due to random noise. Because, you know, uh, I assume that milk production probably fluctuates up and down for dairy cows for no real clear reason uh, that has nothing to do with prolac. Maybe it's something like temperature or how that cow's feeling or how old it is or whatever. So how confident are we that, uh, how confident are we in our results that there is a true treatment effect? Another way to think about this, more statistically at least, is that how likely is that data, let's say we have a 50% increase in milk production due to prolac, whatever, how likely is that result, assuming the null hypothesis is true, meaning there's no difference in milk production between the cows that did and did not receive this prolac supplement. If we assume that there's no treatment difference, how likely is it that we would still find a 50% increase in milk production in the cows that received prolac? That is what we talk about in terms of confidence. Now, we can define confidence quantitatively st using statistics, and we're going to get there in a later lecture, or qualitatively when we talk about validity, which is the subject of this lecture. Before we talk about the qualitative aspects of scientific confidence, I wanted to give you an example of quantitative uh, confidence or scientific confidence. And that example is coming from the first scientific peer-reviewed paper I ever published, uh, Naselski et al. 2015, Taking a Trip Down Memory Lane. So, uh, you know, what I was doing in my master's, I was measuring nitrogen fixation in soybean. So, uh, long story short, soybean is a legume. It fixes its own nitrogen or more precisely, it forms a symbiosis with bacteria that fix nitrogen and give it to the plant. We don't need to know, know the details, but I was looking at nitrogen fixation in soybean. Um, and what you see here is farm fields. And what you see is at, at the edge of those farm fields are um, uh, tree rows, uh, kind of border, tree borders. And there's a lot of, you know, it looks pretty. There's benefits like it can reduce wind erosion. And um, yeah, it's just a pretty nice thing. But it can, it can reduce yields of the crops close to that tree row. Uh, because of competition. And we call that the tree crop competitive interface. So what I was doing is I was measuring nitrogen fixation both in the middle of a field, of a soybean field, and right by that tree row in what we call that tree crop interface. We were also looking at the effects of a simulated drought using these rainfall shelters. But let's forget about the drought. And let's only focus on nitrogen fixation in the middle of the field versus close to the tree row. Was there a significant difference between these two locations in terms of nitrogen fixation? So here is a quote from the paper. Um, and the, here's the key, the key sentence. Um, at all three soybean growth stages, because we measure nitrogen fixation three times, uh, 
um, mean percent NDFA, nitrogen derived from the atmosphere, in soybean was significantly higher in the tree crop competitive zone compared to monoculture. Now, what we have significantly, and then we have what we call a p-value or a probability value. We're going to talk about this in a later lecture, but this is what that p-value means. A, let's say we, we measured a 50% increase, 50 increase in nitrogen fixation in the tree crop competitive zone compared to the middle of the field. Let's say we found a 50% more nitrogen fixation. What this p-value is saying is assuming that that result is kind of fluky, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, i.e. meaning as in uh, there is no true difference in nitrogen fixation between those two locations. The real, there's really no difference. The probability of getting the results we did, you know, 50% higher nitrogen fixation uh, is about, is less than one in 1,000 because you see P.001. If it was P equal to 0 0.001, it would be equal to one in 1,000 chance. So, you know, one in 1,000 chance is a very, very low probability. And so that means we can reject the null hypothesis that there is no true difference in nitrogen fixation between those two locations. And if we look at the data, uh, here is an, a table from the paper. You can see percent NDFA, the percentage of nitrogen that came from fixation. You can see it was much higher uh, in the agroforestry, what we call the agroforestry system, right next to the tree crop competitive zone. So uh, this is not due to chance, these results. There is a real treatment effect that nitrogen fixation is indeed um, very, very likely to be impacted by the location in the field, the middle of the uh, field versus the tree row. What I want to focus on now are uh, what's between those brackets, P less than 0 0.001 or 1 1,000. So the P is a probability. And what I'm saying here or what this document is saying is that given the null hypothesis or assuming the null hypothesis is true, meaning as in there's no real difference in nitrogen fixation between the middle of the row and the tree crop competitive interface. Assuming that there is no real difference in nitrogen fixation between those locations, the probability of getting the results I did uh, is about is less than actually one in 1,000 because 0 0.001 is one, one over 1,000. So less than one in 1,000 chance of getting the results I did if the null hypothesis was true. And because that's such a low probability, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is a significant difference in nitrogen fixation between those two, those two locations in the field. And here you can see data. I'm gonna show you some data here uh, from the paper. Uh, and if you look here, if you look at nitrogen derived from the atmosphere at the three different timings that I measured it in the monoculture, so the middle of the field versus agroforestry system, which is really just close to the tree row, you can see very, very big differences in nitrogen derived from the atmosphere. The other thing you're going to notice here is that I have the average mean plus or minus the standard error because I use replication. Okay, and so again, I want you to start thinking, you see these plus or minus, um, that is a standard error. And what that is indicating is that, you know, I measured nitrogen fixation on not just one plant, but and not just one area, um, but multiple areas in the middle of the field, multiple areas close to the tree row. And there's gonna be some natural variability there. And that's what the standard error is capturing. More on that in a later lecture. So while that was just an example of quantitative confidence, we can also talk about qualitative aspects of confidence. And we're going to start doing that by talking about validity. Now, validity is really broken down into two different aspects, internal validity. So how fair is the experiment in terms of how fair is it of a test of the predictions arising out of your hypothesis? So how fair is the experiment itself? And then external validity, which is how applicable are those results to the real world outside of the experimental conditions that you set up? The internal validity of an experiment is basically this. How confident can we be as scientists that there is a causal relationship, a direct relationship between the treatments we're imposing and the variable that we're measuring, the variable of interest, what we call the dependent variable. 
So be that, you know, if we're applying the Prolax supplement or applying a PGR and our dependent variable is milk production or lodging, how confident are we that there is a causal, direct causal relationship between those two? That is what internal validity uh, speaks to. So there's basically three requirements for internal validity of an experiment. The first one is very obvious, that the cause or the treatment, it must precede the measurement of the effect. So if I measure lodging before I apply the plant growth regulator and then say, oh, the plant growth regulator reduces lodging, that is not an internally valid experiment. It's kind of obvious, but um, the treatment must precede the effect. The next one is that there has to be uh, a statistically significant relationship between the cause and effect. We'll talk about that again in a later lecture, but there has to be a statistically significant result. Now, finally, and this is this is a key key part of internal validity, other possible causes of the apparent relationship between the cause and effect are excluded. And so when we think about, for example, auxiliary hypotheses or alternative hypotheses using inference, that is what we do. And very often as scientists, we'll take measurements, not because we actually are interested in them, but that we want to uh, exclude other possible other possible explanations for the data and exclude other, uh, other explanations for causal re re relationships. So our real focus is on that third criteria, uh, designing an experiment uh, such as we can, you know, as far as possible, rule out and eliminate any other factor that could result in an apparent treatment effect, an apparent causal relationship when there in fact is none. So by taking precautions in the design phase, uh, we can enhance the degree of confidence that we have in our results and protect us from criticism further, further down the line especially at the publication stage where peer reviewers uh, very often will read a paper and reject it because, um, you know, you did not, the authors, the scientists didn't rule out other possible explanations. And in fact, the explanation that the scientists chose isn't the only one. It's not necessarily even the most likely one that's causing their results. It's very common. So uh, three key steps to avoid, and we typically avoid these in the design phase of the trial are avoiding inappropriate controls, uh, avoiding confounding data, and avoiding bias in sampling or measurement procedures. So let's talk about those. In order to declare a treatment effect, it is important to compare the treatment of interest to the appropriate control. This seems obvious in principle, and if you're just thinking about it in the abstract, it would be really easy. But in practice, when you're actually doing the research, it's not always readily evident evident what constitutes an appropriate control. Here's a really simple example that illustrates the point. You're going to figure out if product B increases yield in canola. Pretty simple task, right? You're going to um, uh, collect yield at the end of the season, and you're going to see if product B can increase yield. So you apply two treatments. You have your negative, con negative control with no product B, nothing applied, just regular canola. And then you have product B, you're going to apply product B in a spray. You're dissolving you're dissolving product B in water and applying it to the crop. That's very common, commonly done for crop inputs. You're applying about 200 liters of water per hectare. And you're also applying product B with what, with what we call an adjuvant. An adjuvant is very common additive. You add it to mixes in a spray tank to help the product stick better to the leaves, very commonly used, um, especially if water, P, uh, water pH is, is, is unfavorable. Um, often you will also adjust pH and you'll add an adjuvant. So uh, you would think this is a simple experiment. You have your two treatments. You're gonna spray, spray product, be on a bunch of plots, not spray anything on a bunch of other plots and then look at yield. But this is not necessarily an appropriate control. Why? Because aside from just applying product B, you're also adding water, you're watering that crop, and you're also applying an adjuvant. And for example, if you find that product B does increase yield, well, was that yield increase due to product B or the adjuvant? You are not 100% sure. I mean, it's probably likely to be product B, but you cannot be 100% sure. You, cannot, you can't be sure either that the yield increase wasn't due to product B or the adjuvant. It was just because it was a very dry year, and that water helped increase canola yield, the water in that spray. 
So the solution here would be to not just have one control, but you would probably want to have another control uh, or another two controls rather. One control where uh, you didn't add any adjuvant or product B, but added water at a rate of 200 liters per hectare. Uh, and another another uh, control where you just add the added the adjuvant itself without product B. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about this example later in the lecture. But here we have an example of um, things, you can see things get complicated. Confounding occurs whenever the treatments you are imposing are systematically associated with some other independent variable that affects the response of the variable of interest. Now, that's a very wordy statement, and we're going to get into some examples that really illustrate what I mean by here. Um, and it normally, this is an error that normally originates in the design of the study at the start. Uh, so it's normally, i.e., it's something that you as a scientist can normally avoid if you properly design the experiment. In agronomy, this is the branch of research I'm most familiar with, but in agronomy, confounding with spatial variation is really the most common confounder, and we avoid it by randomizing, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But there's other uh, kinds of confounding uh, that I've run into in my own research that, you know, you have to think through what is, what is wrong with the experiment, and then you figure out what's going on. So other sources of confounding are timing of application treatments. Um, I was working with, for example, two technicians. We were applying a product to a crop, and one technician was getting very high responses with this product, and other technician was not. And it was consistent that one tech was always getting really high responses, that other technician, low responses when they were applying the product to the crops. And it turns out that um, the product itself, it, it said you can apply it um, between, you know, this growth stage and that growth stage. There's like a one-week period during the season where you could apply it. And it turns out that the technician that was getting the really high responses, uh, yield responses to the product, was applying it at one end of that range of application at later in the application window, and the other tech that wasn't was doing it very early in the application window. So that was a confounding. Uh, we should have been more specific about when that uh, product was applied. Uh, also, things like source of materials. So in, in germination, seed germination research that I do, um, seed lot really matters. You can have the same variety, you know, you germinate in the exact same Petri dish, but seed lot, so the year and example, even the field that that seed was um, produced in, uh, that has a huge impact on germination. So you really need to control for your seed lots. And if you don't, you're going to have some confounding going on. Uh, also things with confounding with persons making measurements. It's super easy. For example, let's say you have someone measuring plant height. Uh, one person, you know, plant height, how, how tall is that plant? One person might use a uh, round to the nearest five centimeters. Another person might round to the nearest centimeter. And uh, you're going to get some confounding unless you account for, for the fact that some people round differently uh, when they're making measurements. Other sources of confounding include timing of application treatments. And this was, um, for example, for my lab, it was a real head scratcher for us. But uh, we were testing a new product out in corn. And two different research technicians were applying the product. And this is over multiple sites in multiple years two different technicians, and according to the instructions uh, for this uh, new, new, new input that we were testing, the instructions say there's this one-week window you can apply it during the growing season. This is when you should apply it. And so these technicians were getting very different results. One technician was always getting huge yield responses to this product. The other technician was not. It was like not that product was doing nothing for yield. And it was really confusing. Like we had no idea what was going on. But then when we looked at the exact dates of when these technicians were applying it, one technician was systematically applying it like at the last day, at the end of that window, and the other technician was applying it like the first day, like as early as possible in that window of application. So you have two very extremes. Even though we're within the same one-week application window, you know, one week can make a really big difference, especially depending on the weather. And so this uh, really confounded our results until we figured it out and we could explain away why some uh, some some of our results were showing no, no treatment effect, and some were showing very high treatment effect. And we concluded that um, you would actually want to spray towards the end of this application window for maximum effect. And when we looked at the literature, uh, other people actually found the exact same thing. 
So what we see here is a classic example of a confounding variable, spatial variability in a field experiment. And this is an example to give credit where credit is due from the tweets of uh, Dr. Dave Hooker and Mario Tenuta, a MAFRA specialist in field crop pathology. So uh, here you have a pretty typical experimental design for testing a fungicide in a field trial. A farmer uh, is going to, they want to see, hey, is this fungicide, this new product beneficial? Is it increasing my yields? Is it profitable to use? So I'm going to apply, apply this product to half of my field and not apply it to the other half. Come the end of the season, I'm going to look at yields between, you know, the left side of the field, the right side of the field, and, you know, how are yields higher? Are they a lot higher? And is it profitable for me to, say, next year, buy this product and spray it across all my fields? So, you know, whatever the farmer, whatever results that farmer is going to get from this trial, it's, it's, it's going to be incorrect because of this confounding variable, which is yield potential or the natural, we can just say, for example, the natural fertility of the soil is different across the field. On the left side of the field, sprayed where the uh, fungicide was applied, we can see that the soil is just higher in natural fertility if you're just looking at yield potential of the field. So on the left side of the field, even if the fungicide is sprayed or not sprayed, it's typically yields are going to be higher on the left side of the field than the right. And so the farmer who's spraying this fungicide and then on one side of the field and not the other to make a decision, to use that information to make a decision, they're not accounting for this confounding variable that the left side of the field is just higher yielding naturally. And they have to account for that when they're uh, setting up their experimental design. So here's an example of um, a replication that can allow us to deal with this kind of spatial variability. So instead of having one side of the field treated, i.e. meaning as in the fungicide is sprayed, and the other half unsprayed with no fungicide. Here you have strips going up and down the field. So the idea here is that on, for example, the left side of the field, if we go back, the left side of the field, which is naturally higher yielding, is going to have strips of sprayed crops, sprayed with the fungicide, and unsprayed crops. And the right side of the field, which is naturally lower yielding because of whatever inherent soil properties, that, that right side of the field is also going to have strips of sprayed and unsprayed crops. And so the farmer will be able to account for this confounding variable essentially by blocking or replicating. We'll talk a bit about more, a bit more about that in a second. So the way we deal with spatial variability in field experiments, we do it by uh, blocking or replicating, so we have we don't just say divide the field into halves and have a sprayed and unsprayed, or if we're testing three varieties, divide the field into thirds and plant one variety on each third of the field, but we replicate and we also randomize. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about uh, replication and randomization. So this is an example of a replicated but poorly randomized trial. So we have replication but not randomization. So we divide the field into three, into thirds, and each third is one replication. So we actually have all the treatments in each replication. So on from left to right, we have rep one, two, and three. In replicate one, we have variety one, two, and three. Then in replicate two, we also have variety one, two, three, and so on. And this uh, is well replicated, but not randomized. Because if you look, it's always the same pattern in each replicate. We have the strip of variety one, then variety two, then variety three, and, and on and on. Now, this might not look like it's gonna cause a problem, but because it's not randomized, it, it actually will bias our results. So look at um, the observed average yields of the three varieties without randomization. If we actually properly randomize this trial, which is, means that within each replicate, we're just randomizing the pattern or the order that the varieties are planted in, that the treatments are imposed. So in replicate one, we have variety one, two, and three. Then in replicate two, we have variety two, three, and one, and then three, one, and two. And just that, that change in randomization, properly randomizing the treatments within each replicate you have differences in yield. And when we compare, uh, when we look at the comparison of the varietal yields, we can see how much of a difference this makes. So 
going from left to right on the screen. Well, first on the y-axis, we have the true uh, or observed percent difference in yield. So let's say the true uh, difference in yield, the, the underlying difference in yield, uh, you can see on the far on the left side, the true difference, which you know the biggest difference would be between varieties three and one. And the smallest difference would be between varieties three and two. If we had an unreplicated trial, if we just divided the field into thirds and planted a variety, we would actually have a very different uh, observed uh, percent differences in yield than the true one. If we have replicated but not randomized, you can see that we're approaching a bit better the true differences between varieties. And if we have replicated and randomized uh, experiment, we have much more accurate, not, not, not entirely accurate. It's not, it's not um, exactly the true percent difference, but it's much closer to the true percent difference. And so by replicating and random, random, randomizing our treatments within our replications, we can better approximate, we can get, we get to better towards, we're approximating, we're getting closer to the true percent difference in yield. So the way we deal, in summary, the way we deal with spatial variation, spatial confounding, these are two, two words for the same thing, uh, in field experiments is we replicate and we randomize. So let's give one more example of confounding variables in agricultural research. And let's focus now on animals. Let's focus now on our favorite pet, our pet dog, for example. We love our pets, and we don't want our dog to ever be sunburned. Sunburns hurt. We don't want it. So we have a hypothesis that uh, the more hydrated an animal is, the more resistant it is to sunburns. We have some sort of mechanistic explanation. I'm making this up. Uh, but we predict that the more water uh, our pet drinks, the lower the severity of sunburns. So to test this prediction, what we're going to do is every day we're going to measure how much water our pet dog is drinking. And then at the end of the day, whatever, we're going to look at, measure the severity of its sunburns, let's say. So in this graph, you can see where the causality, um, the direction of causality, that the more water or the less water that Rover, Rover drinks, the more or less or the less or more severe its sunburns will be. Okay, that's fine. That's a fine prediction. But what we are forgetting to account for is the confounding variable of temperature. So um, very hot days typically are also very sunny days. So it's a, if it's a very hot day, our pet dog will probably drink more water than normal. And if it's a very hot day, it's probably sunnier than normal, which means that sunburn severity will probably be higher than on a, whatever, an overcast day that's very rainy and there's not, the sun is not out. So if by ignoring the effect of temperature, this relationship, which might be true that the more water you drink, the lower your sunburn severity will be, would be completely reversed because on really hot days, we're going to have high water consumption, but also very sunny days, we're going to have um, more, more severe sunburns. So we need to account for confounding variables to be able to look for and make true tests of predictions. So remember what I just said earlier, in field research, when we're dealing with spatial variability and spatial confounding, we replicate or block. Uh, so for example, we would put strips across the field instead of splitting it in half. In other situations, uh, what we do is we deal with confounding variables by using what we call covariates, and we do covariate analysis. So the essence of covariate analysis is this. Instead of ignoring the confounding variable, we measure it explicitly along with the variables we are actually interested in measuring. And what that allows us to do is during our statistical analysis, we can take out the confounding effect. We can remove it to understand the more, the more pure effect between our dependent and independent variables. So let me give you an example. This is a real world example from the master's research of Rachel Boucher, who is, long story short, looking at soybean yields across different types of inputs. So she's applying different um, uh, mycorrhizal fungi to soybeans, different levels of uh, fertilizer and mycorrhizal fungi and looking at yield. But Rachel's research, uh, while it's located in Northern Ontario, and this is a, a, um, a picture of the field, uh, there's lots of wildlife, lots of deer. I mean, she saw lots of different animals here. And the problem is her plots are being eaten. Uh, her plots are being eaten by whatever deer. So she might, so we want to understand the effect of these 
fungal additions adding mycorrhizal fungi. But if some plots are really badly eaten and some plots are not badly eaten, then that's going to throw off our whole analysis. So what Rachel is doing to deal with this confounding variable, the confounding variable of random you know, animal predation in her plots, is to rank every single one of her plots with a wildlife predation severity index. We don't have to know exactly what this is, but she's accounting for how much of the, the area of the plot that is affected, so the size of the plot that um, is, is damaged, and the severity of the damage. And so every plot that she has, every soybean plot she has, is going to have, a, an aside from yield, which is what she's really interested in, will have a, a value from 0 to 10 indicating how severe the wildlife predation is. And this can be used in a covariate analysis to better understand the pure effect of these mycorrhizal fungi on soybean yield. So the last set of issues uh, that we'll talk about, which can destroy the internal validity of our experiment and can reduce the confidence we have in our results, is bias. Now, bias uh, covers a wide range of, of issues. We have selection bias, measurement bias. We'll talk about some other forms of bias in a section. Bias can be intentional or unintentional. And let's start with selection bias. Now, selection bias has to do with the way we go about selecting things to measure. All right, so what do I mean by that? Um, first, let me, let me talk about the way we avoid selection bias. So let's say we want to measure uh, plants or we're measuring animals. What we would do generally to avoid selection bias is to come up with very clear predetermined rules before the start of the experiment as to how we go about sampling animals or plants or whatever. So, you know, we're going to sample every 10th plant in a row or we're going to sample, you know, every fifth animal we come across is the one we're going to measure, do our measurements on. So we have clear determined rules uh, uh, that randomize or, or, or essentially randomly select um, things to measure. Uh, but we can also have unintentional selection bias. And let me give you an example here. So let's say we want to know the sex ratio of walleye uh, in a given lake. So what's the ratio of male to female fish in this lake? So we go about, you know, we, we, we are going to go, we go fishing in the lake. We use this lure that you see here, this bait. And uh, we just, you know, we, we count like how many male and female fish we capture, right? Sounds pretty simple. But let's just say that this lure, the, the bait we're using, is slightly more attractive to males than females or vice versa, right? Then the measurements we're taking, uh, we're actually going to be slightly biased because we're selecting, unintentionally, we're selecting more males or more females than we would in a random, a truly random procedure. Uh, and so the way we would, I mean, if this is a plausible, if this is a possible possibility, so, you know, if we know if other Let's say other people have shown that, hey, the lure you use is going to influence whether you're capturing more ma male or female fish, then we would need to do a random, uh, uh, an experiment, a pre-experiment, just to find an unbiased lure, an, a lure that would allow us to select, truly randomly select uh, male and female fish, i.e., meaning as in a lure that is equally attractive to male and female fish. So while unintentional sampling bias will affect the internal validity of an experiment, explicit sampling bias is going to affect the external validity of the experiment because the experiment is conducted only on a specific subset of the population of interest. And thus, you can't really generalize your conclusions to the overall population, but just to that specific subset. So for example, let's say you are looking at the effect of oh, uh, I don't know, um, a uh, given drug on, uh, let's say, a performance-enhancing drug on someone's, you know, runtime or uh, a, a memory-boosting drug on, on someone's ability to memorize words or definitions, whatever. Let's say you start advertising, you start recruiting subjects, you start looking for people uh, on TikTok, uh, and you start advertising on TikTok, hey, join my experiment, I'm testing this thing, or you start recruiting um, people on campus, on the university campus, where you know most people are between 18 and 22, uh, you are going to have a uh, sampling bias because you're just getting younger people because you know, I don't really know anyone over 30 that's on TikTok uh, 
And I don't really know. I mean, most people on university campus uh, are, 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 you know, under 22 years old. So, you know, you're going to test this drug uh, on people you recruited and you're going to generalize and say, hey, you know, this 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 drug boosts memory or it boosts your 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 running performance. But really, you've only tested it on young people, not on the much broader, say, Canadian population, which, you know, average age is much older than the people on TikTok or on a university campus. We also have attrition bias, which, you know, I mean, basically people will drop out of a trial before it's complete, but that's not a random process. The people that drop out are typically subjects uh, or are subjects that don't see a benefit or or see a ne- something like even a reduction or a negative impact of the treatment. Uh, so, for example, let's say you're looking at different whatever weight loss methods subjects who are not losing weight are going to be more likely to withdraw. And this biases the sample towards those people for whom the method is successful. Because at the end of the experiment, the people remaining are generally going to be people who responded positively to this you know, weight loss method. So sampling bias affects the external validity because you're not going to know in this case with attrition bias, you're not going to be able to generalize to the broader population of interest. So I want to give another example of how we can avoid unintentional selection bias uh, in agronomy experiments here in this case. So often when we do agronomy experiments, we're really looking at yield. And by yield, we're going to measure, you know, yield for all the plants in a given area. So, you know, in a plot that's 15 square meters, we'll, we'll harvest all the plants and measure yield. But to measure nutrient uptake, which is also an important measurement, in many cases, we're not going to um, measure nutrient uptake of all the plants in a given plot. That's like 100 plants or more. Uh, we're going to just randomly select a couple of plants, hand harvest them, grind them, and send them for nutrient uptake analysis. And it's been it's been shown very often that if you walk into a plot and you say, hey, I'm just going to randomly select randomly select four plants in uh, in the plot, you're going to, your eye will be drawn naturally to the biggest kind of nicest looking plants in that plot. And you're going to bias your measurement because the biggest, best looking plants have much higher nutrient uptake rates than smaller plants run to your looking plants. So what we do in our lab, we have a, a procedure where, you know, two or three weeks after planting, when, when uh, the seedlings are up, the, none of the plants are very big. They all kind of look the same. They're just sprouting. Essentially, they've just emerged. We, we place these flags, and you can see one here. I took a photo um, of uh, here. You can see we place flags. We'll randomly flag plants at that stage because there it's truly unbiased. Your eye is going to be naturally drawn to all the plants equally, and we just place these flags randomly in a plot next to plants. And then we come back you know, three, four, five months later when we want to measure nutrient uptake to hand harvest, and we go back to the plants with those, with those red flags next to them. So even assuming there is no selection bias, there is still the opportunity for the person conducting the measurements to introduce bias. Consider this example of data collection involving weighing live animals on an electronic balance that you see here. Typically, the value is going to fluctuate as the animal moves about, and so the researcher must choose a value within that total range that appears to be the most common or average. And if the person making the measurement knows what the treatments are, so if they know that this rat was fed the high-fat diet or this rat or mouse received the antibiotic, this brings about the opportunity to select for higher or lower values accordingly. And again, this is not necessarily intentional, but if you know, hey, this mouse got the high-fat diet, uh, what's its average? Your mind is naturally going to veer towards you know, values on the higher end of that average as that scale is fluctuating, the values on that scale are fluctuating. And so typically, again, what we do is, um, what we can do is have very clear predetermined selection procedures. So we can say, you know, at five seconds, once I put the mouse on the scale, I am going to record that value that is on the scale. Or at 5, 10, 15, and 20 seconds, I'm going to record the, the, the value of that scale, how, how the weight of that mouse, and then I'll average those values. So, so just needing to have a rule. Um, there's other scenarios where you're taking measurements and the measurements, the, the instrument needs to reach a steady state. So let's say, for example, you're taking leaf photosynthesis measurements. Typically, you got to wait, you know, you start the experiment and you got to wait 10 or 15 minutes, let's say, 
for the uh, instrument to reach steady state and for, for the values to be uh, accurate. But let's say on some leaves you measure leaf photosynthesis seven minutes after starting the experiment, and some leaves you you wait 15 minutes after starting the experiment. You know that is going to introduce bias of its own, especially if you're varying you know seven minutes versus 15 minutes across your treatments. So again, the way you typically avoid this is by having a clear and consistent rule. Like every plant, every leaf I'm measuring, I'm going to measure it at 15 minutes, and you just do that consistently. A final way that measurement bias can be introduced into an experiment is when the measurement itself is somewhat subjective and depends on some the person's perspective. So going back to that example earlier with Rachel Boucher's master's research where she was visually evaluating uh, wildlife predation damage in her plots, you know, she has to evaluate the severity and the area of the plot that was affected. And that's somewhat subjective, right? Someone's definition of severely eaten plot, a severely, you know, predated plot with lots of damage might be different than another person's. And so the goal and the idea here is that you want w only one person taking that measurement on all the plots. If you have two or three different people, say, making measurements of like disease incidents from zero to 100 or, you know, how the, the effectiveness of weed control from zero to 100 you know, one person's definition of 30% weed control or 30% disease, you know, disease um, uh, incidents is going to be different than another person's, especially if it's just visually evaluating it and there's no kind of measurement or tool you're using. And so you want the same person taking those measurements um, in, in the experiment. Another way we can introduce bias into our experiments, particularly experiments that have measurements repeated over time, is via termination bias. And in a nutshell, termination bias is introduced when uh, our decisions to start and stop experiments are based on whether we have significant results or not. So here's an example. Let's say again, we're testing the effect of prolax supplementation on dairy cow milk production. So we feel feed some cows prolac, we, feed, uh, we, we don't feed prolac to other cows, and then we measure milk production every week, okay? Uh, between these two groups that did or didn't get uh, prolac. Now let's further assume that there's no real difference in milk production, that prolac is just complete snake oil, it doesn't increase milk production, doesn't do anything. Uh, even if that's true, given natural variation and variability, you know, it just so happens that some one week or, or at some point in time, the cows getting prolac will have just naturally higher milk production than cows not getting prolac. Again, just due to random variation and variability, not due to the prolac supplement. Uh, but if we're going to stop the experiment once we get a significant result, then what we'll say, be able to say is that, wow, there was a positive effect of prolac. It just took you know, 10 or 12 or 20 weeks to get there. Um, whereas in reality, you know, there is no true effect of prolac. Conversely, if we decide to stop the experiment when we have a when prolac when we see that prolac reduces milk production randomly again it's random variation and variability, uh, we're, we might conclude that prolac reduces milk production even though again it does nothing, um, but we're making decisions to start and stop experiments based on these significant results. So the uh, the way to avoid this kind of problem where 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 you might where you're you're going to be forced to conclude that there's a significant result, positive or negative, when there isn't any at all, is to have very clear predefined rules about when you're going to stop and start the experiment. And you make those rules up before you even see the data. So you say, you know, 20 weeks after supplementing with Prolac, that's when we're going to stop the experiment, no matter what, or what have you. Another way you can introduce bias is at the data analysis step of the scientific method when you're analyzing the data. And, uh, you know, outliers, uh, data set reduction. You can remove outliers without uh, introducing bias, but this is the way you, you will introduce bias when you remove outliers. So let's say you do the statistical analysis, you're at the data analysis step, and the data does not support your hypothesis or your prediction. And once that happens, you say, hmm, I'm going to start looking for bad, quote unquote, bad data, you know, what I'll call outliers to eliminate so that the data will support 
will support uh, my hypothesis. That is when you can introduce bias. Because the question is, would you have done the search for outliers if the initial analysis had supported your conclusion? Let's say there really were outliers in that data set, but your initial analysis supported your conclusion. Well, you're not gonna bother looking for outliers. And so that's when you, you introduce bias. When you start looking for outliers after the analysis in response to the statistical analysis, as opposed to before, before you do the analysis. When you do it before, that's totally fine. There are you know, very well-defined statistical tests to detect outliers. We won't get into them in this course, but they're not very hard. You can do things like interquartile range. There's a number of statistical tests you can do to say, hey, this data point is a statistical outlier. And then you can eliminate that outlier before you do the analysis. But if you're looking for outliers only after you do the analysis, then you're introducing bias because you know if the initial analysis was favorable to you, you wouldn't have looked for outliers in the first place. Okay, so uh, my group, as a general rule, does not eliminate outliers at all. We don't even do statistical tests um, just because we believe uh, as kind of a philosophy that you know, we study biological systems and there's always going to be variation in biological systems. And so, you know, outliers might be informative, but we will eliminate outliers uh, for two reasons. And this does vary from research group to research group. But what we do is, first off, we will eliminate uh, data that is biologically impossible. So, for example, I was working uh, on a data set looking at oats, an oat agronomy trial, we were measuring harvest index in oats. And the highest harvest index you can get would be like 60%, I mean, 70% might be possible. You, I've never seen a, real, a harvest index of 70%, but we were getting harvest index values in some cases of 80%. And we knew that that was biologically impossible. Um, you know, I won't go into the details of what harvest index is, but it was just impossibly high. And in those cases, we know that, hey, there must have been a measurement error. There must have been some mistake because there's this is not possible a possible, biologically possible value. So we eliminate that. We're not going to include a data point that just is, is, is completely impossible to actually have. The other one, we, uh, the other way we'll, we will eliminate data points, uh, we'll reduce our data set if there's a very clear and valid reason to do so uh, based on a prior measurement. So... A general, generally in our lab, what we do is we fly drones. Uh, this is me. I was flying a drone. Um, <clears throat> and we fly drones, you know, typically towards the end of the season to look for any plots where there's obvious damage, wildlife damage, planter errors, you know, whatever, something that renders that plot, you know, there's a, there's an issue with that plot and we flag it right away. So, you know, for example, here you can see this is a variety trial uh, and you can see um, there's like a big hole here. There's a kind of a hole here. There's a hole here. You know, there's a hole here. And these plots are going to have lower yields, not because of the variety, but just because there's a big hole in the plot, right? So you're not going to have as high yield. So, you know, we fly these drones and we can really quickly be like, okay, plot, you know, 110, plot 240, plot 318, flag it, flag it. And we probably won't use that data. It's going to be low yielding, but not because of the variety, but because of something else going on. Confirmation bias arises out of the very human tendency to be more accepting of information that seems to confirm our existing beliefs or preconceptions. We tend to demand a higher standard of proof for conclusions that are unpalatable compared to ones that are desirable. So, you know, in terms of public policy, uh, you know, take whatever pol public policy issue you want, uh, but people tend to read news sources or follow people on Twitter or, you know, blogs or whatever uh, of people that have that share their perspective. And they're, they're much less likely to seek out information that can that can potentially contradict their their preconceived view of things. It's, it's much more difficult to look for information, again, to refute our beliefs. And that's exactly what science tries to do. We, we're testing, we're testing hypotheses, or, or more specifically, predictions from hypotheses, and we're testing them, basically trying to reject them. It's not very, it's not very intuitive, or it doesn't come naturally to us. Uh, and certainly when we're, when we're just browsing the internet or what have you, confirmation bias typically leads us to source of information that confirm what we already believe. In science, this can also lead to the file drawer effect, where let's say um, we're testing the effect of prolax supplementation. And 
you know, m- m- one study has already found that prolac can increase dairy milk production. And we do a study, and it turns out that prolac does nothing for dairy milk production. Doesn't increase it, doesn't reduce it. We might just, you know, take that data instead of trying to publish it or publicize it. We're just going to, you know, put it in the file drawer where it will never see the light of day. And generally, we publish studies, we try to publish studies, publicize studies as scientists that show a significant effect that, you know, prolac significantly increased or significantly decreased milk production. But if it does nothing, if there's no true treatment effect, we just put that away. We don't really publicize that. And this can introduce confirmation bias in science when we do meta-analyses. Meta-analyses are basically when you don't do any experiments yourself, but you collect hundreds uh, or thousands of experiments and analyze the results of all those thousands of experiments at once. It's a very powerful technique, but it suffers from confirmation bias because, for example, if you're doing a meta-analysis of the effect of this prolax supplement on dairy milk production, well, then, I mean, you're the, the studies that are published that you have access to are probably going to be biased towards having a significant effect because uh, studies that found no significant effect of prolac probably were filed in a drawer somewhere and, and are not publicly available. So far, we've mostly been talking about internal validity of experiments, but now we're going to focus a little bit on the external validity of experiments, which is... How well do our research results generalize to the real world, commercial farms or real real world barns and not research settings? As agricultural scientists, this is really a critical thing to consider because the end users of our research are not normally other scientists or not always other scientists. They're part of our audience, but it's really farmers or people in industry. So we always have to think about you know, how well do our testing conditions, does our experiment reflect real world conditions? Are, can we translate our results to commercial farms or are they specific to kind of the research environment that we've created to do our experiment? So let me give you a really simple, a really simple example. Again, going back to this prolac supplement that may or may not increase milk production in dairy cows. So let's say we do the study at the University of Guelph. We test the effect of prolac. We give some cows prolac. We don't give prolac to other cows. We look at milk production. And it's very internally valid. But we only, for for whatever reason, we only have Jersey the, the Jersey breed of dairy cows. We don't have, say, Holsteins. I'm just making this up. But we only test it on Jersey cows because that's the type of dairy herd we have at the university. Uh and let's say it turns out that all of Ontario has Holstein dairy cows. And so we conclude based on our study, let's say that there's no effect of prolac on milk production. Prolac doesn't do anything. It's snake oil. And we conclude that this is a, a very valid finding. We tell Ontario dairy farmers don't supplement with prolac. It's a waste of money. But it turns out that, well, we lack an external validity because uh, we're only looking at Jersey cows. But if all the Ontario dairy farmers have Holsteins, maybe Prolac does increase milk production, but just in Holsteins and not in the Jerseys, the Jersey breed that we were testing on. Again, I'm making this up, but this is something we we need to consider things like this when we're designing our experiments. Um, another thing, you know, we can consider to increase the external validity of research results as scientists is to make our data publicly available, uh, especially for meta-analyses where scientists will collect thousands of studies, hundreds of studies, and analyze it all together to be able to detect things like, well, maybe the effect of prolac is breed-specific because of the hundreds of studies uh, done, you know, prolax studies, let's say some might have been done on Jersey, some on Holsteins. And in a meta-analysis, we would be able to say, hmm, it seems that the studies that had Holsteins found a positive effect of prolac on milk production, whereas the ones in Jersey's didn't. That would not have been um, detectable necessarily in a single experiment, but in a meta-analysis, we can come up with these broader conclusions that make you know, our results more externally valid because we can tell end users with more confidence when and where they are likely to see, for example, treatment effects. Fertilizer studies uh, are classical cases of experiments where we typically need lots of different site 
sites in different years to properly evaluate the treatment effect, i.e., uh, does this product increase or decrease yields reliably? Now, typically in master's theses, for example, you're testing, you're, you're going to do an experiment at one location, typically the Alora, Ridgetown, or Winchester Research Station, and you're going to test it for like two years. And that can cause issues because the results of fertilizer studies are gen generally specific to the site and the year. And so you need to collect lots of sites and years, what we call site years, to get a proper understanding of the fertilizer product. So, uh, for example, let's just go back to the, uh, the prior example looking at the effect of this Follier B product in canola. So um, <clears throat> let's say we do find, we, we do the experiment in Dundalk, and we only do it in 2011, for example. This is actually real-world data. We can see that this Foliar B product, it's boron, boron being a plant nutrient, increased yield by 5.2% in Dundalk. So we could conclude just based on one year, on average, right, this could be a well-replicated, well-randomized field study, on average, boron is going to increase canola yield by 5.2%. But let's say you did that exact same study at Shelburne, okay, and you did that over two years. What you can see here is that in one year, um, boron reduced yield by 9.6%. One year, it increased it by 0.9%, this boron product did. So you would conclude that on average, there's like very little to maybe a small negative effect of foliar boron uh, on canola yield, right? Different sites, different years, different conclusion. And so the point here is that, you know, we, we typically lack external validity if we just do, a, a fer especially a fertilizer experiment in one site uh, or even two sites in one or two years. We generally need a lot more data a lot more site years to be able to more reliably give advice to farmers in terms of does this product increase yields or decrease yields. It's actually even better practice as a scientist to not only measure yield at all of these sites and years, but also to take soil measurements. Not because you're interested in the soil per se, but because you can then look at, you know, are there certain covariates? Uh, does boron increase yield in certain kinds of soil textures or, you know, in soils with very low versus very high organic matter, for example, right? So we can kind of try to understand why uh, this foliar B product works some years but not in others. Uh, so, so generally, when we think about external validity of our results in terms of when we're doing fertilizer studies, um, we, we typically will do the same study over and over and over to generate, generate improved external validity. Some of you may be wondering if there is a tension between internal and external validity in scientific experiments, and you would be absolutely correct. Uh, there's often a trade-off, especially in agricultural research, between uh, these two different kinds of validity. So as experiments become more and more tightly controlled, as we try to minimize bias, as we try to reduce and control confounding variables, and as we try to minimize uh, random sources of variation in our experiment, it becomes more and more artificial. And so while we're, we are increasing the internal validity of the experiments, uh, the experiment itself is becoming less representative of the scenarios where the findings would most likely apply, you know, commercial farms. So we have to be aware of this trade-off. We have to think through it as we're designing our experiments. All right, so this has been a fairly long lecture. So let me go over again what I want you to take out of it. And if you're not sure about these, if you're still not sure about these subjects, just contact me and we can go over it in class again. You have to understand what confidence is, define confidence and qualitative uh, and quantitative ways to think about confidence. And here we really focused on the qualitative aspect of, of scientific confidence. You need to talk about internal versus external validity. What are the differences here? You need to understand the three keys to in good internal validity, which is having proper controls, uh, avoiding confounding data, and avoiding bias. And you also have to define and give examples of external validity as well, and be able to think through uh, and understand examples where we have tension between internal and external validity.